Uh, reporting. What I want to show you now, viewers, um, is a wonderful scene. Um, these are uh, Muslim mums. Um, there's a little fella here uh, who's bought a little sign. And this is in commemoration. You can see his little sign to the heroes of London. Uh, there are flowers on the street here. Um, ladies with hashtag turn to love, hashtag ISIS equals enemies of Islam, hashtag ISIS will lose, hashtag turn to London. And I think uh, a poignant scene and a scene we should sit on just for you viewers uh, to understand exactly how people feel here on the streets of London, so close to what were such brutal attacks last night. Welcome back to the show. I scream, you scream. You know the rest. 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 Well, I scream, you scream. You know the rest. I scream, you scream. Well, you know the rest. I scream, you scream. Well, you know the rest. I scream, you scream. We all, well, you know the rest. I scream, you scream. You know the rest. I scream, you scream, we all know the rest. I scream, you scream, you know the rest. I scream, you scream, well, you know the rest. I scream, you scream, you know the rest. Mike Myers says, yeah, baby. 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 Mike Meyer says, yeah, baby. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. Well, a child's happiness is priceless, right? Especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on their birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A a child's happiness is priceless, especially when it comes to their birthdays. Absolutely. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. A child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. Well, a child's happiness is priceless, especially on a birthday. Show thanks new on Sunrise. Frank Ocean tells a major fast food chain to buzz off. And which celeb peed in a glass jar? Frank Ocean tells a major fast food chain to buzz off. And which celeb peed in a glass jar? Frank Ocean tells a major fast food chain to buzz off. And which celeb peed in a glass jar? Frank Ocean tells a major fast food chain to buzz off. And which celeb peed in a glass jar? Interesting question. Frank Ocean telling a major fast food chain to buzz off. And which celeb peed in a glass jar? But first, the severe flooding here in the Northeast as more rain continues to fall today. NBC hey. sees Michelle Kaczynski, I guess she's in the canoe, is in Wayne, New Jersey this morning. Hey Michelle, good morning to you. Good morning. Well, obviously we're getting a nice break from the rain, but not the flooding. This is essentially now a part of the Passaic River in this neighborhood. It rushed in yesterday. I just got a picture of the conditions that Caleb Brown has been living in for the past two months. Essentially, she was by the neck inside of what would look like a steel cage, roughly four by four by six. And that steel cage was then inside of a larger uh, container. Now, a massive search is underway in this field behind me because the victim herself told police that she believes as many as four bodies may be buried here. George. Boy, that is just horrific. Okay, Lindsay. An ABC News producer is being investigated by the network after reported evidence that a live camera shot on Good Morning America was doctored by falsely stringing police tape in the background. The shot featured reporter Lindsay Davis in Woodruff, South Carolina, where a woman was allegedly held captive in a storage container by a registered sex offender. Behind Davis, yellow police tape can be seen with the words, Sheriff's Line Do Not Cross. A wider photograph of the scene shows that police tape was actually just attached to some ABC camera equipment to enhance the scene. Dateline NBC. 
a primetime news program, airs a story in 1992 entitled Waiting to Explode. The story includes footage demonstrating that a line of trucks produced by General Motors readily explode on impact. To see for ourselves what might happen in a side impact crash, Dateline NBC hired the Institute for Safety Analysis to conduct crash demonstrations. Unlike GM tests, the fuel tanks were filled with real gasoline. Look what happened. At impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank. According to our experts, the pressure of the collision and the crushing of the gas tank forced gasoline to spew from the gas cap. The fuel then erupted into flames when ignited by the impacting car's headlight. After the program airs, one of the firemen at the taping of the crash contacts GM. The conversation inspires a full-scale investigation. Three months later, NBC is forced to reveal their role in fabricating the news. NBC's contractor did put incendiary devices under the trucks to ensure that there would be a fire if gasoline were released from the truck's gas tank. We said the crash, quote, forced gasoline to spew from the fuel cap, end quote. GM says since the gas cap was the wrong cap for the GM filler tube and because the gas tank was overfilled, the cap came off when the impact occurred. We agree with GM that we should have told our viewers about these devices. The Dateline reporter, however, said, quote, at impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank, unquote. GM has now x-rayed that tank and found no hole. We acknowledge the placing of the incendiary devices under the truck was a bad idea from start to finish. That's our new policy, and we'll be right back. What Fox Television told us was that we were just the people to be the investigators. Do any stories you want, ask tough questions, and get answers. So we thought, this is great. This is a dream job. Fantastic. The very first thing they had us do was not to research stories, but to shoot this promo, which was the investigators. investigators. Uncovering the truth, getting results, protecting you. And they had a film crew and a smoke machine, and we were silhouetted. Investigative reporter Steve. One of the first stories that Jane came up with was the uh, revelation that most of the milk in the state of Florida and throughout much of the country uh, was adulterated with the effects of bovine growth hormone, the artificial hormone that farmers were injecting into their cows so that they would produce more milk. With Monsanto, I didn't realize how effectively a corporation could work to get something on the marketplace. The levels of coordination they had to have. They had to get university professors into the fold. They had to get experts into the fold. They had to get reporters into the fold. They had to get the public into the fold. And of course the FDA, let's not leave them out. They had to get the federal regulators convinced that this was a fine and safe product um, to get it onto the marketplace. And they did that. They did that very, very well. It's a great time to be a high-producing cow. Posilac One Step, bovine somatotropin by Monsanto. The federal government basically rubber-stamped it before they put it on the marketplace. The longest test they did for human toxicity was 90 days on 30 rats. Posilac is the single most tested new product in history and is now available to you specifically so you can increase your profit potential. And then either Monsanto misreported the results to the FDA or the FDA didn't bother to look in depth at Monsanto's own studies. The scientists within Health Canada looked very carefully at bovine growth hormone and came to very different conclusions than the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. did. Monsanto's engineered growth hormone did not comply with safety requirements. It could be absorbed by the body and therefore did have implications for human health. Mysteriously, that conclusion was deleted from the final published version of their report. They knew there were problems. They saw serious potential human health problems and they stood up in Canada and said, we're not going to approve this because we don't believe it's safe. We have been pressured and coerced to pass drugs of questionable safety, including the RBST. I personally was very concerned that there's a very serious problem of secrecy, conspiracy, and uh, things of that nature, uh, and something needs to be done. The FDA was then on the hot seat. They had to come up with an answer. They didn't come up with a good one. And they never took the opportunity then 
I mean, what would they do? Pull it off the market and say, we need to now do the job that we didn't do the first time? They didn't do that. We wrote the story. We had it ready a week beforehand. They bought ads. Farmers in the milk industry say it's safe, but studies suggest a link to cancer. Don't miss this special report from the investigator. That Friday night before the Monday this series was to begin, the fax machine spit out a letter from this very high-priced lawyer in New York that Monsanto had hired. It contained a lot of things that were just off the wall false, just demonstrably false. But if you didn't know the story and you didn't know how we had gone about producing it, it uh, would have scared you as a broadcaster, as a manager. And they decided that they would pull the story and they would just check it one more time. But the bottom line was that there was no factual errors in that story. Uh, both sides had been heard from, both sides had had an opportunity to speak. One week later, Monsanto sent the second letter. And this was even more strongly worded. And it said there will be dire consequences for Fox News if the story airs in Florida. And this time they freaked. They were afraid of being sued, and they were also afraid of losing advertising dollars at all of the stations owned by Rupert Murdoch. And he owned more television stations than any other group in America. I mean, that's 22 television stations. That's a lot of advertising dollars for Roundup, Aspartame, NutraSweet, and uh, other products. So we got into a battle, and uh, the first deal was uh, the new general manager. And his name's Dave, and Dave is a salesman, and, you know, he'd pump your hand. How you doing? How you doing? He called us upstairs to his office, and he said, um, what would you say if I killed this piece? What if it never ran? And we said, well... You know, we wouldn't be very happy about that. And he said, well, I could kill it, you know. And we said, yes, of course, you're the manager. You could kill it. It, it would never air. And uh, he's hemming and he's hawing and he's back and he's forth. And we couldn't figure out, what is this all about? And finally he blurted out, look, would you tell anybody? You know, I said, I'm not going to lie for you. About a week later, calls us back to the office and says, okay, we'd like you to make these changes. In fact, you will make these changes. We said, well, look, let us show you the research that we have that shows that this information you want us to broadcast isn't true. To which he replies, I don't care about that. I said, pardon me? And he said, no, that's what I have lawyers for. Just write it the way the lawyers want it written. I said, you know, this is news. This is important. This is stuff people need to know. And I'll never forget, he didn't pause a beat, and he said, we just paid $3 billion for these television stations. We'll tell you what the news is. The news is what we say it is. I said, I'm not doing that. And he said, well, he said, if you refuse to present this story the way we think it should be presented, you'll be fired for insubordination. I said, I will go to the Federal Communications Commission and I will report that I was fired from my job by you, the licensee of these public airwaves, because I refused to lie to people on the air. And uh, it's thank you very much. Uh, you'll hear from us right away. Well, 24 hours came and went. And we didn't hear a thing. And about a week later, he calls us back, and now we've changed strategies. How about if we pay you some money and you just go away? And I said, how much money? Because, you know, when somebody offers to bribe you like that, I always want to know if it might be worth it. He was going to offer us the rest of our year's salary if we agreed not to talk about what Monsanto had done, to not talk about the Fox corporate response in suppressing the story and to not talk about the story not talk about BGH again anywhere not take the story to and he said are you gonna sign and we said nah Dave we're not gonna sign that and he said we'll send it back okay I said no nah, Dave we're not gonna send that back it was okay we can't buy you out we can't shut you up. Let's get the story on the air in a way that we can all agree it will go on the air. And we started rewriting and editing with their lawyers. Well, during this eight-month re-review process, I say, jokingly, uh, they did things like, for example, they wanted to take out the word cancer. You don't have to identify what the potential problem is. But just say human health implications. Any criticism of Monsanto or its product, they either removed it or minimized it. And it was very, very clear, I would say, almost every edit they made to the piece, that was the aim. And we changed this and this and this, and then that wasn't good enough. Okay, now change this and this and this. Now change this and this. Version after version after version, 83 times. 
83 times is unheard of. It doesn't happen. You shouldn't have to rewrite something 83 times. Obviously, they didn't want to put the thing on the air. And they were trying to drive us crazy and get us to quit or wait until the first window in our contract so that they could fire us. They, in effect, announced that they were going to fire us uh, for no cause. Well, this was a little much. And Steve wrote a letter to the lawyer in Atlanta, whose name is Carolyn Forrest, the Fox corporate lawyer. And I said, you know, this isn't about being fired for no cause. You're firing us because we refused to put on the air something that we knew and demonstrated to be false and misleading. That's what this is about. And because we put up a fight, because we stood up to this big corporation, and we stood up to your editors, and we stood up to your lawyers, and we said to you, look, there ought to be a principle higher than just making money. Look at a pyramid. In the first couple layers, the really eager, hard-working young journalists are out there trying to get the stories, trying to make a name so they can move up that pyramid. Well, the further they move up the pyramid, uh, the more they realize that, uh, you know, the outlets really aren't interested in major news that rocks the boat. The boat Charles refers to belongs to those at the top of the pyramid, where the interests of the media outlets are quietly defined. The year is 1917 and Representative Oscar Calloway enters a disturbing statement into the U.S. Congressional record. The statement reveals why J.P. Morgan Interests hired 12 high-ranking news managers. The 12 were asked to determine the most influential newspapers in America. They were to figure out how many news organizations it would take to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. The Twelve found it was only necessary to purchase the control of 25 of the greatest papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought and an editor was placed at each paper to ensure that all published information was in keeping with the new policy. Soon, that policy would be defined by a front group formed by J.P. Morgan and his colleagues. In fact, Morgan's personal attorney was founding president of the organization, the Council on Foreign Relations. Today the CFR maintains that its goal is to increase America's understanding of the world. However, the actual objective of this highly exclusive club is revealed by the rare admissions of the insiders themselves. In the early 60s, a Georgetown University professor collects information for a book favorable to the network of powerful men who founded the CFR. For two years, Professor Carol Quigley is allowed to examine the confidential papers and secret records of this network. Quigley reveals that these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world. And the CFR is their most visible conduit for carrying out that agenda. CFR members include America's wealthiest tycoons as well as the highly placed elite in government, academic institutions, tax-exempt foundations, and the establishment media. Ruling Class Journalists, written by Richard Harwood, describes the CFR membership as the ruling establishment in the United States. The Washington Post article boasted that news reporters who are CFR members do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the United States, they help make it. Who are these policymakers? Many of their faces are familiar. NBC's Tom Brokaw, CBS's Dan Rather, ABC's Barbara Walters, Jim Lehrer of PBS, William F. Buckley of National Review, media mogul Rupert Murdoch, owner of the giant multifaceted news corporation. These media heavyweights, and many others like them, are members of the CFR. Powerful corporations are also invited to become members. 
At the close of the 20th century, CFR influence presided over far-reaching consolidations of media control. In 1995, CFR members Michael Eisner of Disney and ABC's Thomas Murphy merged their media empires. Soon after the merger, the Disney-ABC empire becomes a CFR corporate member. In the year 2000, the world's largest internet service provider, America Online, joins forces with Time Warner, one of the world's largest news organizations. The CEOs favoring the move are CNN's Thomas Johnson and Time Warner's Gerald Levin, both CFR members. Once again, another media giant is created under the shadow of CFR influence. Today, an elite handful of individuals define the agendas that are supported by the empire of establishment news. In 1990, an age-old conflict in the Balkans erupted into civil war. A multi-sided and complicated overseas struggle was packaged by the mainstream media as a tidy melodrama. The predominantly Christian Serbs were cast as the villains. A key maneuver employed to demonize them involved a photo shoot. The news has always been used to stampede our reason with a, a perception and emotion. When you're talking about war, you get those heart-tugging appeals to pity in particular, and we've seen that again using images. Benjamin Works, president of the Strategic Issues Research Institute, is a military affairs analyst for Fox News and CNN. He recalls the emergency shelters set up by the Serbs to accommodate Bosnian refugees. I remember very vividly seeing tours by the camp commander showing the mess hall, showing food that, you know, I wouldn't pay money for, but I'd eat, gladly eat if it were free. And yet this was turned into a sensational story about a concentration camps. And the propaganda twist on that came out of both the electronic media and the newspapers and very glaring covers on Time magazine and such. Judgment. An independent expose reveals how a British film crew photographed a Bosnian emergency shelter to look like a Nazi concentration camp. The film crew positioned themselves inside a barbed wire enclosure to shoot out at refugees who were free to come and go as they pleased. The camera zeroed in on a refugee whose emaciated appearance was the result of a birth defect. We found that all of these uh, allegations of a concentration camp were, were really frauds perpetrated by the reporters. And in fact, at least one, Roy Gutman, won a Pulitzer Prize for this kind of fabrication. And the image that helped motivate American involvement in an overseas entanglement was a total fake. One of the CFR's strongest media allies is the New York Times. As a major outlet for the establishment viewpoint, the Times has achieved dominant influence over the reporting of national and international news. The Times is relied upon by many editors in the mainstream news media for direction on how to portray world events. In addition, the Times Wire Service retails the establishment line to subsidiary outlets such as broadcast news distributors and regional newspapers. Competition between these outlets rests primarily on the style of regurgitating the same message. At a 1991 closed-door meeting of fellow internationalists, billionaire and former CFR chairman David Rockefeller praised his media allies, but his confidence that his words would not leave the room was later broken. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. With literally millions of events occurring around the world every day, the media simply can't report on all of them. But like the Times slogan, all the news that's fit to print, 
The mainstream media implies that they can be depended on to report what is significant. What isn't made clear is exactly who or what dictates which events are newsworthy and which are not. If it bleeds, it leads. This cynical saying, often regarding mainstream news, implies that violent or catastrophic reports are peddled as top stories. Rising water and the two planes collide. Horrific or dramatic events alone create strong emotional responses. Add to that sweeping statements that stir public fear. The police can't stop it. Reports of war, nuclear threats, natural disasters, scandals, and murders often fill the daily news for reasons other than to inform. Preying upon fears viewers have concerning death and destruction is so frequently practiced by major news that most viewers are desensitized to the actual intent of the reports themselves. Good evening. There are new and dire predictions tonight about the future of our planet. Around the world, glaciers are in full retreat. Some, like the ancient ice cap on Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, could be gone in a decade or two. It's a dramatic symptom of the warming of the Earth, detailed in a new thousand-page United Nations report, Climate Change 2001. It predicts the new century will bring, and I quote, large-scale and possibly irreversible changes affecting every last person on Earth. Today's population has already set off an environmental spiral, depleting the world's forests and contributing to overfishing and overgrazing. Soil is being eroded, which in turn is hurting crop production, leading to starvation. This is punishment, say scientists, for sins of the past, the end result of years of pollution, wildfires year-round in California. That 500-year flood that devastated Grand Forks, North Dakota, occurring every five years. Greenhouse gases that stay in the atmosphere a hundred years after they're released. It is a doomsday scenario detailed in a report sponsored by the United Nations. Sweltering summers, rising sea levels, more droughts, more violent storms. Global warming is real, the new report declares, and humans are helping to cause it. By creating a, a, a crisis or a perception of crisis, you accomplish several things. First of all, people in a, in a crisis do not think rationally. People in a crisis uh, look around and, and say, geez, we have to do something. Uh, something is, is upon us. And so in a, in a panic atmosphere, crisis atmosphere, people are willing to uh, accept more stringent controls. No matter what the current news-hyped crises may be, the proposed solution by mainstream news remains consistent. Global warming is real, and it's something that, that uh, needs to be taken into account uh, very seriously in, in policy decisions. And the emissions are a policy question. If we don't move now, any chances that we have for conserving the environment, maintaining political stability, or offering opportunities to individuals will be totally washed away in the extraordinary load of so many people. China, the world's most populated country, now controls the phenomenon by demanding its couples produce just one child, with harsh penalties for those who fail to comply. Most countries agree family planning should be a top priority the UN begin setting the next decade's priorities on population. Global warming, uh, ozone depletion, overpopulation, uh, deforestation, biodiversity, all of these are being presented as global crises, the equivalent of war, the things that demand uh, uh, immediate uh, action for survival. In fact, we're told global survival is at stake here. And in each of these cases, we're told these are global crises that cannot be handled at the local and national level. They, require, they are global crises that require global solutions. Today, Americans are told global warming will destroy the planet. However, only a few decades ago, they were told that the planet would be destroyed by a more chilling crisis. What scientists are telling us now is that the threat of an ice age is not as remote as they once thought. If we are unprepared for the next advance, the result could be hunger and death on a scale unprecedented in all of history. During the lifetime of our grandchildren, Arctic cold and perpetual snow could turn most of the inhabitable portions of our planet 
into a polar desert. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other two American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session.